In this episode of the podcast, I get to sit down with two of my good friends. We're going to be dissecting what happened at Adobe Max, plus a conversation with a shark. All that's coming your way next on This Week in Photo. This is Twitter. Hey, folks, welcome back to This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Uh, It's going to be an interesting show. It's that time of year, or at least it was a couple of weeks ago, where Adobe kind of reveals what they've been working on for the past year. And we all knew what it was, right? We all knew it was going to be a bunch of AI stuff. We've seen the generative fill, of course, Firefly and all the generative image stuff that they've been working on. But geez, who knew how deep that AI well goes at Adobe. They basically seems like they've you know got an edict from on high to weave artificial intelligence into almost everything they do. At least the popular products like Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere, etc. So we're gonna we're gonna do an exhaustive discussion of everything that was announced at Max. There's plenty of YouTube videos and blogs that, that cover that. But what I wanted to do is have these two gentlemen that you'll see in a second come on and talk about the things that they found interesting at Max. And of course, I'll do the same. Uh, But to do that, I've got my co-host here with me, Mr. Alistair Jolly. What's going on, man? Hello. stayed up late for this. And we started late. (laughs) Yeah. And it's been a busy week. Lots of things happening in the photo world, especially in the movie. I know. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good time. It's a good time to be a photographer. Yeah. Maybe. Excellent. Time. Uh, Great to be yeah. back, though. And did you say something about there's a shark here? Jeez, I better be careful. There is a shark. Wait, wait. Uh, you know, I should lay some music in here, like the the Jaws music, before we bring the shark on stage. Look at that, the land shark himself. <laughs> Sharky James. What's going on, Sharky? You are our guest today, but you know, I feel like you're going to be on more and more. So, you know, yeah, today you get to be the auditor or the kid sitting in the back of the class, but you know, going forward, you may be in front of the class. So, yeah. So how's it going over this joint? It's going pretty good. It's been a while. It's been like a little over five years since I've been on TWIP. I know. Yeah. I was 20. Half a decade. (laughs) Yeah, I was nine. I was twenty last time. So Sharky, uh, so first of all, welcome. You know, and uh, you know, we were chit chatting off screen a little bit, but uh, and you've been to our, the Twit member mixers religiously. Thank you for coming to those. But I wanted to do a quick catch up on Sharky James and where he's been in terms of podcasting and photography and all that stuff. For the folks that may not be familiar with you, or the folks that are familiar with you, but from the Petapixel Photography Podcast, what's the state of the union with Sharky James right now? The state of the union is better than ever. So awesome. if you've listened to my show, you notice it's gone through some changes. Same format, but this Christmas marks nine years, unbelievably, mm-hmm. of my show. Flies. I can't believe it. time just goes just like that. So in on Christmas night of 2014, I launched what was the Lens Shark Photography Podcast. And, you know, I got like all my stories from Petapixel. I was friends with those guys over there, Michael and the gang. And so about eight months into doing my show, Michael Zhang over there was like, hey, why don't we team up? You know, the, your, uh, your peanut butter is great in my chocolate. Your chocolate's great in my peanut butter. You know, kind of like mix, you know, cross the streams, make something happen right there. And so that's what we did. And so we rebranded as the Petapixel Photography Podcast. And so I was Petapixel in name only for a little over seven years or so. And this last December, well, leading up to December, I decided I want to get back to doing YouTube stuff. I wanted to do maybe reviews and that kind of content. And I thought, well, that's going to create a conflict because they have guys that are doing reviews and stuff. So within if the Petapixel photography podcast guy is doing it and they're doing it, which one is, you know, it's just kind of created confusion. So I'm like, here's an easy, elegant way to, you know, disambiguate as the word is right. And just rename (laughs) it back to the lens shark photography podcast. It was the same feed. So all the same listeners and no one cared. They don't care what the name of the darn show is. Right. So Mm -hmm. since uh, around Christmas time or so of this past year, it's been the Lens Shark Photography Podcast again. So if you look for it in whatever you listen to podcasts, uh, and you're going to find two different things called the Lens Shark Photography Podcast. The one that's got my little character on it is the one you want. The one that just has the giant 
you know, shark fin and, and, uh, and the big words that say Len Shark Photography Podcast. That is the original feed with the first 40 episodes. That's the origin story. You can see how horrible I was back then compared to now. I'm just regular horrible, but I was extra <laughs> horrible back then. So that's, um, that's basically it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, I never, I haven't gotten around to doing the reviews and stuff. We've had a whole lot of life stuff happened and then just been busy with other projects with my sponsors and such, but I'm going to get back into doing that. I'm here in my home office set studio. It's a mess behind me, but it's going to start transforming here in the next couple months. And, and we're going to get that going. So I love check it. out I the Len Shark Photography Podcast. Just the right one, or you'll be disappointed. And you'll hear news Isn't from it? late 2014. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll know then. Uh, yeah, inter- yeah, introducing the new Sony Mavica. It's amazing, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? They take floppies. That's great. You got those yeah, lying around. I still they have that well. one. I have it. Uh, you know what? I was I was just thinking, you know, you mentioned you've been doing that for, you know, the better part of a decade. And it's isn't it crazy, like both of you guys, isn't it crazy how time it sounds it sounds contrived, but how time flies. And doing this stuff, especially doing the kind of stuff that you love and enjoy, it doesn't feel like work, doesn't it? It just accelerates and you have no idea that you blink your eye and you have basically created quote your life's work or a career right when you just started this thing i was like oh that might be fun to do and you blink and like oh i'm an og now <laughs> you know? yeah it's it's hard Chad, I mean, GPT I, knows about me yeah yeah, yeah. what are you gonna say it nailed it too it, yeah it's crazy how fast i, I when in, in our house this weekend we celebrated my son's 16th birthday and that was a that was a moment of realization how fast time is going but yeah i mean blink of an eye and you look at what what we've created and you think about well when did you start live streaming when did you start podcasting you're like oh a couple of years ago and then you're like oh no it can't be a couple of years ago we've had a pandemic in amongst all that so it's definitely not just a couple of years ago yeah time's mm-hmm. going faster and faster all the time yeah and you know what i find i find that the friends because we meet you we all meet a lot of people right so i find like the friends that we meet along the way like what, what was it I, I i forget what the saying is that you can only really realistically have a certain number of friends and it's a small number like 10 or 15 or so that you can keep up with and you know be a good friend keep tabs on their life etc yeah. and we've met hundreds and hundreds and i find over the time over the years the eras that you meet people become kind of like your rings on a tree like oh yeah i met you back in it was a imaging usa in 2019 right <laughs> you know it becomes that. Yeah, it, it is. It is really strange. And it just makes you feel old because it's like, oh, yeah. yeah, I've been doing this for, you know, it's going on, you know, let's say over a decade. I think we're at like 12, 13 years plus on TWIP now. So it's uh, it's it's easy and hard at the same time. But it's still, Shark, you can attest. So both of you guys can attest to this. The This kind of stuff, especially doing podcasting, which is inherently technology related, talking about something that is artistic and nerdy and you know gear ish all that stuff it just it's a it's a never changing surface so it's always something new it's like fishing in the ocean so yeah I the audience it. knows this story cuz we've already we've talked about this before but i used to listen to twip back when i was a photojournalist before i even mm-hmm. thought about getting into podcasts and i you know so i i listened to twip going back way to the beginning and i thought well this looks easy to do. This, if this guy can do it, I can do it. I mean, look how easy it looks. It's you effortless. <laughs> oh it my look, gosh! I think we've it all went so through darn that. effortless. <laughs> we've all went through that. We've all thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to stream and I'm going to do podcasting. What do they do on Twip? Let's see what they do. Let's see how easy it is. We've all we've all yeah. checked out Twip to see how how to do oh, it ourselves. Good. I love that. I love it. And the the interesting thing about that, and I've helped a bunch of people, you know, start their podcasts who've gone on to be great. You know, like Valerie, you know, Valerie Jardin, right? So she started her show on on Twip and then transplanted it. So it's it's yeah, it's it's interesting when people come in or when I when I teach people how to do or help people get started on podcasting, that's always a point in time because everything changes like every week. The tools get better, the you know, software, the hard the the 
podcasting services. Everything now is kind of dialed in for the most part. It's going to get better and better, but right now there's no, okay, you got to get Skype set up on this machine and NDI it over to that machine and do this and bubble gum and all that stuff. Now it's just like we're using Ecamm Live, which works pretty well, right? So Ecamm Live yeah. on your Mac. Once you figure even, out your audio and the system preferences, it's great. Right. Well, there's sync issues and all that, but you know, <laughs> aside from all that, you know, the, the tools are there. Plus there's cloud tools and all that. So yeah, yeah, very cool. Lots of stuff. Well, let's dive in guys. Let's dive into the topic du jour for this episode and, uh, and chat about it. So Adobe Max was a couple of weeks ago or a week. Yeah. Yeah. About a week and a half ago. And they announced a bunch of stuff, you know, from, from Lightroom enhancements to Lightroom with, with Boca being able to blur the background on your shots and make it look realistic a la portrait mode on the iPhone and Android. Um, there's been enhancements to the generative AI features within Photoshop. Of course, there's Adobe Firefly that got announced and a bunch of other kind of skunk work projects that we didn't know about. So I want to talk about what we think is best. So I'm going to, I'll link in the show notes over to a bunch of resources that exhaustively go over everything Adobe spilled during Max. I wanted this discussion to be more about what we three thought was important there from the perspective of our, our audiences. And Sharky, I want to, I want to, since you're our guest here, I want to give you the baton first and, uh, you know, tell us if anything, you may, you may be an anti Adobe person. You may say, you know, the best part about Max is when it was over, you know, <laughs> so, or not, but hoping you don't say that, but yeah. What, what do you think? Well, I'd be happy if they rewrote Lightroom and made it faster, but I've been complaining about that for nine years now, right? Good luck. So it yeah. can, we can always, we always want it to be faster, but yeah. lens blur in Lightroom is pretty darn magical. Mm -hmm. It works. It's going to get better. It works pretty great right now. So you could, like I was telling, I think it was, we were talking in the, in the mixer the other day, you could shoot, I wouldn't suggest this, but you could shoot something at F22 and see all your sensor dust and everything. And then later on, well, okay, here's a better example. You don't have to buy the best lens anymore if, if you want good bokeh or bokeh, as everyone seems to say. L let's you not can shoot it that. At <laughs> 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 it's bokeh because somebody from Japan told me that, and that was yeah. uh, that was Martin Bailey. So anyway, right. but he's an Englishman, so <laughs> an Englishman, Englishman, he's an Englishman. <laughs> I know it's bokeh. <laughs> Okay, like that. Okay. So anyways, um, you could shoot where your lens is sharpest at 5.6 or so, and then later make it look like you shot at f1.2. Yeah. And it is pretty darn convincing right now. Mm. So for me, I think that's where, and, and I threw it a photo that was, I shot it um, back in August. I went to uh, Fujifilm, which is one of my sponsors, went to, I went to this uh, Create With Us Seattle event. So I actually got out of Boise for one. I mean, you know, I, br I broke the the, uh, the magnetic Take field that keeps me here. And I, yeah, I was going to say, did you yeah. bring your passport? <laughs> I brought my passport and I went to <laughs> went to the free state of Seattle, uh, Washington there, uh, free city. So anyways, the I shot uh, this BMX like freestyle uh, rider guy. This guy hasn't given up on BMX freestyle. He's like in his 50s. I would break my backside and everything. He's still doing freestyle on his, you know, trick bike and everything. And I threw it a photo that was really just not ideal for knocking out a subject from a background. You know, the cleaner the background, the easier it is to create an auto mask or just mask it yourself like anyone does that anymore, right? You just kind of fix it. And it nailed it. It popped him right out of the background. Well, it didn't pop him out, but it selected him. And then from there, you can apply the lens blur so you can decide what mm. kind of bokeh you have, how much bokeh. And then if there's point light sources, you can choose, you know, regular round bokeh, ball, bokeh balls or the mm -hmm. football shaped kind, you know, with more uh, coma. You could have uh, more one that's more um, like a hexagon, more kind of like aperture blades, etc. And it worked really well on that with the complicated background. So imagine, I didn't even try it on a regular, you know, nice one that would be easy to pop out because mm -hmm. it's gonna nail that, you know? Yeah. So, and then it's cool, there's like a heat map kind of thing. It's almost like night vision, but well, you know, infrared. And you click on it, I forgot what it's called, but you can then visualize 
what's going to be in focus and what's going to be blurred. And so you see this band, you can adjust the sliders and you can make the band expand and decide how much is going to be in focus and what's not. And it is, it, it's pretty amazing. I'm pretty impressed with it. That's the standout yeah. feature for me. And then point color, of course, if you want to, I'm wearing it, you know, Stacy uh, Pearsall's veterans portrait project uh, shirt for the second time going to old school. Yeah, hold that on, up. Uh, hold that up. Yeah, there it is. There you go. Love it. Yeah. For good. the second for the second time on Twip, I think I wore this like seven years ago or so. Hey, it doesn't Anyways. get old. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> Especially if you don't wash it. No, just kidding. <laughs> Too much info there. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a oh, prop shirt only. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, just, kidding. just kidding just kidding so uh you know something like this where you've got a black shirt which just blends into my background here and looks horrible you could you click on it you could change the color so if you want to you know match a color to something else in the scene or you want to change something that is so much it was fairly easy to do in photoshop in lightroom maybe not as much but now so easy hdr optimization the other feature I don't know. It, it just yeah. it looks a little cray cray. It's a little stuck in customs times ten. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's that like, was an era. Yeah. Sorry, sorry yeah, Trey. Crunchy. <laughs> yeah. Well, he knows. He yeah. knows. Yeah. He, yeah. He bought a house in New Zealand based on that crunchy technique. So <laughs> he bought all care. of New Zealand. What are you talking about? He's got the hobbits and everything. He totally does. You know, I'm curious like about it. that feature. I haven't I haven't played with that with that feature in Lightroom. Uh, but when I look at it or when I read about it, I, I'm of course, I'm thinking portrait mode, and let me bring my camera up here. So, oh, that's not me. Here I am. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so here's my camera, and I'm running. So the camera I'm on is a Lumix BG H1 with a 12 to 35 lens on it, 2.8. It's micro four thirds, right? So that's that's what I'm working with, and this is what it. So I'm running the latest Sonoma operating system on the Mac, right? So if I go in and turn off, I've got portrait mode at its lowest setting on right now. So if I turn it off, that's what the bokeh looks like natively from this camera. When I turn it on, this is what the lowest setting portrait mode looks like. But here's where it gets a little funny, right? So I'm going to drag it up to exaggerate it. So this is about 50% of Apple's portrait mode coming from this camera. This bokeh doesn't look convincing to me. Like I'm seeing like the blur around my the edge here, that picture of my daughter back there, when I had it hanging on the wall as I was testing all this stuff, it kept thinking it was a real face and it would apply focus to her and then quickly snap back to me. So it was kind of iffy and not convincing generally, which is why I have it set to this all the way down right there. I, mean, I feel like that it's better. It's still not great, but it's it's more. It's the blur that I want that I can't get out of this lens. Is Turkey is that feature better than what Apple's doing on the operating system level? I mean, it sounds like it is if you have control over the circles and confusion and all that. It is way better, way better. It works incredibly well. Well, you're you know you're doing it on video. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. So I think that's more challenging, but actually, you know, a still subject is, I don't know, it's got time to think or something. Who knows? <laughs> you know, <Man. laughs> it's yeah. doing something, it's doing some kind of magic, but it, you got to, it, it's a try. It's amazing. It is amazing. It doesn't always nail it, but it is getting pretty close now. Yeah, interesting. Like, Alistair, from a portrait photographer standpoint, it, the math used to be, or maybe it still is, if you, you know, fast lenses, you know, to get, so you get better bokeh, you can control it, yada, yada, yada. And that was kind of almost the mark of a professional photographer, you know, hey, look, look how luscious and blurry that background is on that portrait of that couple standing on the city streets with all the, you know, blurry city lights in the background. Is that over now? I mean, is it like, Alistair, do you think, you think the mechanics of buying expensive lenses, Adobe just kind of shot a hole in that and now you could buy the cheap lenses like Sharky says and change the bokeh later? Cool. Quite, quite possibly. I mean, yeah, it was always, you know, buy a fast lens, but also the quality of the glass to get the, the, the quality of the shape right. of the bokeh, you know, that, you know, it wasn't just good enough to have it nicely blurred, but people specifically wanted a certain shape of bokeh. Mm -hmm. I tried the, the lens blur and for a V1, I was, you know, I was, not expecting great results, you know. I was like expecting it to be, you know, pretty good, but 
like Sharky says, I tried it and I was very impressed with just how good it is. And then the granular features of being able to, um, you know, control the amount of blur, but control the shape of those, the, the bokeh, can, you know, it really was quite impressive. I was, I was a little bit, um, a little bit shocked actually at how good it was. Um, really? And yeah, I definitely think, yeah. you know, suddenly we don't need those f one point two lenses anymore, quite possibly. But um, uh, yeah, it was it was very good, exactly. very good for a V one feature. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, I wonder. So both of us uh, and Sharky, I'm not sure about you, but I have Capture One installed. I have Lightroom installed on the machine right now. I tend to, tend to lean towards Lightroom. Um, and then capture one for other things. And Alistair, I think you might be the opposite. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. But do you, yeah, you are. Yeah. So, and I know we're going to get, uh, David Grover on the show, hopefully soon to chat about, yeah, and I'm going to throw this question at David. So David, if you're watching this, I'm going to ask you, where's my lens blur inside of capture one. So do you think this is a temple Alistair, since you use the software, do you think this is a temple feature? for Adobe that's going to distance them, distance themselves from Capture One more and give people more of a reason to either stay with Lightroom or move to Lightroom? Or is it, you know, once you, my, my perception is once you move to Capture One in earnest and start using it, it's a ratchet. You're not gonna go back to other solutions because it kind of, you know, you kind of get used to it and you kind of start loving it and understanding yeah. the nuances of it. But I'm curious what you think about that, being a user of both. Is it is the distance between them like farther now? I think I think it goes both ways. Like moving moving software is always difficult when you have that muscle memory and you've been using something for so long. There are features I knew for like for many, many years I was Lightroom user. And I would yeah. see features in Capture One that I wanted to use, but the effort to change was too great. So I stuck with Lightroom. And people will, I think people will still stick with what they use and what they want. Capture One, very early on, heavily focused on that high-end pro market that were shooting you know, the best they could in camera, wanted the best raw converter they could possibly get. And Capture One really nailed that raw conversion from day one. This um, perhaps is... The, the, you know, the new lens burn stuff perhaps isn't focused directly at perhaps Capture One's target audience yet. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's a great, you know, it's a great, it's a, it's a, as I say, it's a V1 and I was I was shocked at how good it was. It's not perfect. Of course it's not perfect. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it's one of those features where I think there's a, there's a segment of, of the photography market that's really going to love that and, and really make use of it. Um, but it's not to say you can't do it <laughs> traditionally. Like if you have the gear, yeah. you don't need to yeah. do it. You know, it is, it is a, it is a tool to make up for something that's missing, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. But Hey, you know, it's, it's the, the evolution of this technology stuff. Like I was talking about the podcasting gear and its evolution, things just get easier and easier. Mm -hmm. And the conversation, even with this AI stuff that, that's been in the, on our minds and everyone's minds for a while, it's the, the path from what's in your mind's eye, you know, you know, all things considered, you know, considering the genre, like photojournalism, of course, it's you're capturing what unfolds in front of you. But if you're creating something more conceptual or something that you have more control over, the the exercise is getting what's in your mind's eye out in, in into the computer so that you can share that with other people. And the resistance from that, hey, I have this great idea for this mm -hmm. thing, whether it be a photo or a movie or whatever, from that point through the thicket to, okay, here's the final thing and it looks great and I'm proud to show people, that distance used to be really far, right? You gotta like, you know, especially in the film days, or you know, it's like you gotta, you gotta be, you got to have invested a ton of effort and time and money and learning how to do things and making mistakes and all that. And now it was as we fast forward to state of the art today, it feels like those that distance that thicket is getting like thinner and thinner where I could I could have an idea and for something at dinner and. You know, by the time it's time to lay down in the bed, I got to have almost a finished thing that I can start ideating on and iterating on. So that that path from 
idea to finish is almost going away in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I'm curious from both was, of you guys, what, what does that mean? Does that mean we as artisans and all, or, you know, and I use the term loosely for myself, but we as content <laughs> creators and artisans or whatever, does that mean the career field, the basis of it is, does that mean the career field has now, it's wide open now and it no longer requires so much effort so therefore it's you know the value of it is going to be deprecated i don't know uh, sharky you know mean, both you guys i don't know what do you think it means you have to change adapt or die right or maybe yeah. not die adapt or, or get severely wounded maybe sure. i don't know <laughs> but it's scarred. You know, scarred. Yeah. There's gonna yeah. There's ow, that hurt. You're gonna you're gonna <laughs> there's gonna be people like you know, real estate companies, for instance, who would otherwise hire someone to design something for them and spend a bunch of money will just go ahead and get the creative cloud suite and have somebody go, you know, go to YouTube University, learn to do that stuff and create it themselves. And they're not gonna hire people. And as I think as photographers, you're going to have to learn this stuff, offer these things to people, you know, just get out ahead of it. Like I can do this quicker and, and easier for you and it'll look better. You're not going to have to dink around with it so much. But here's what I want to know also is like we were talking a second ago about Capture One versus Lightroom. What about Adobe's ability to just outspend everybody and to just throw everything, all the AI it can into Lightroom, into Photoshop, et cetera, and Capture One and Luminar and these other programs not be able to keep up. Yeah, right. Well, what, I was just looking up Adobe's market cap. I want to see where they're at right now. Are they in the trillions yet? Adobe market cap. Adobe is worth, no, they're not in the trillions yet. That's surprising. Oh, like acquisition target. They're only $254 billion today. Interesting. No. And their, their stock price is 558, $558 US, up $7 today. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, they could, right? But also, Apple, trillion dollar company, Google, trillion dollar company, OpenAI, soon to be trillion dollar company, <laughs> right? They, they could look at little $254 billion company as an acquisition target. And then what? Go back, to, go back to what you, you were talking about, though, Frederick, with the, mm -hmm. the, the gap between thinking about something creatively and getting it, getting it to market, if you like. Yeah. Um, if you watch the keynote, uh, from Adobe, I was I was struck by how many times they they focused on the fact that their their ambition and their drive with AI was to help facilitate creatives get that vision out of their head and and actually create it, mm -hmm. not just create it. It was all mm -hmm. of, they were very conscious about talking about how it's still a creative vision. It's still down to us as creatives to conceptualize and come up with the idea. And they're trying to give us tools just to to make that that gap between you know uh, conception and delivery as, as short as possible. Yeah. And a lot of the demos when they were doing demos of, of some of the features that during the, during Adobe Max, you know, you, you constantly heard about how oh we can we can do this with the tools we have, but this has just made it easier and faster, you know? So I think they, they definitely were deliberately trying to, you know, put their, put their stake in the ground that they're not trying to do away with creatives. And it's, you know, it's, they're still trying to build tools to make life better and more productive for creatives to perhaps, you know, be better business people, if you like, and be more effective and more productive, not do away with them. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like Adobe is building true from or not. The, well, I mean, we could feel that. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, I feel like they're building tools for the next generation of artist or content mm -hmm. creator. Right. And we have a foot in next generation. And if we have the, the wherewithal to evolve into being the next thing that we should be, you know, as a creator, then we'll go along for the ride. But I don't feel like they're creating for just like they're not no one's building film scanners anymore, right? It's kind of evolved right. into something else. And I feel like they're, they're skating to where the puck is going to be versus building for where, where it is right now. Alistair, we didn't get your pick, your, your Adobe Max pick. My, I wanna, my Adobe we, Max pick, um, yeah. it was actually something I, something I'm, I haven't tried yet because I haven't found the right use case to try it, but I'm excited <laughs> to try it. And it was, the, we're all, we're kind of all aware with generative fill, right? What it what it can do. I hate you know, that we started guy. off with con 
<laughs> yeah, poor Phil. Uh, we started off with uh, you know content aware Phil, and now we've got generative Phil, and um, we kind of had ideas of where that was going to go and how we we don't know what it's going to look like yet, but we know that generative Phil is just going to get better and better. But then we started talking about generative expand, and I think that was my fa- one of my takeaway favorite features was oh my God, the ability yeah. to expand beyond the canvas that you have. You know, so many times we've all created content and. You know, we just need it in a different shape, a different format. You know, we just needed that canvas expanded. And watching the demos of it, it looked pretty phenomenal. It was pretty earth-shattering to to see how it can interpret beyond what you've already created, beyond what it, what's on the on the screen, and it be very um, authentic in how it did it. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. keen to try that out very soon. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Isn't that I called out painting that. also? Out yeah, yeah, it depends on the tool. Like Ray, it was in it. Was it Mid Journey or Dali or whoever? One of those. One of those yeah. generative AI companies called it out painting. You know, it's probably Mid Journey. Yeah, um, it's pretty yeah, cool I agree. that it imagines what is out there. Sometimes it's like you know, you talk about hallucinations. They talk. <laughs> it's going crazy sometimes. What's yeah. over here? I don't know. Why is that alien at the bar mitzvah? Yeah, yeah, when Pratik, yeah, you, you guys know, not? you guys know Pratik Naik, right? I think I know Alistair. You know, Absolutely. I don't know if you you know um, Sharky, yep. but Pratik and I had Pratik on, and he was telling me this was yeah, this like six months ago, maybe more, but he was telling right when I think one of those generative AI companies had started releasing out painting in that feature. And he had released this, this, uh, I think it was a YouTube animated GIF showing what he'd done, or maybe it was a short video, but he started with, I think it was a subject. It was a cat or something sitting in the middle of the street. And he just kept expanding out and out from that. And the AI built this whole city scene and all this stuff, all with a perfect vignette down pointing at the cat, you know, (laughs) the whole thing, you know, and I, like you know i saw that and then the other one i saw was these video guys that were talking about kind of the old old days of of uh, film where they used to build partial sets and then have matte painters paint in the rest of the set yeah now we can do that as mortals yeah Yeah. (laughs) now we can totally do that yeah Yeah. so it's crazy yeah and it becomes it becomes more of more of uh, a the weight is on your creativity and what you can dream up versus being inhibited by what you can do because if you have the story in you that's burning that you need to tell a short or whatever now you can do it you know i mean you could probably do it with your ipad or your phone to be honest with you but if you have a computer now you're you know steven spielberg so yeah, yeah. yeah. you have that Great. thought at the Thanks. dinner table yeah yeah, yeah exactly what are you now doing you- I'm, <laughs> I'm editing <laughs> Now you can create stupid things in seconds versus spend like a week doing it and being disappointed. We've so, seen this before, safer. though. We've seen this before, right? <laughs> Remember in the 80s? What was it? It was the 80s, right? 80s or 90s, the, the desktop publishing revolution that was spurred by Apple and the laser writer giving everyone access to all fonts, including the ones that shouldn't be used. <laughs> so we saw all these posters with 15,000 fonts on them and a lot of garbage. In that, the, the same thing can happen now. But w- I think what happened back then, if history repeats itself, was sure, there was a lot of garbage out there, but that forced the people that were professionals to up their game even further. And so you could tell the difference between crap and something that was created by a professional. So I, I got to hopefully believe that we're going to see that again yeah um, i created a, yeah. i created a great poster with wingdings i don't know i don't know why people didn't <laughs> you're the one it, but <laughs> yeah but that that's, that's i had a, um, I, that's wait, Mike. i was gonna say i created a, a parenting magazine back in the mid 90s thanks to the desktop publishing revolution so Hey, 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 James Cameron and his Avatar series. Uh, what was the font that they used for Avatar? Papyrus. You know, that right. <laughs> he, used, he used Papyrus for, you know, the Anything, most one of the most successful movies in history for the logo. Anything Crazy. but brush script. I hate brush script. I used to love Gosh. brush script. I used to love oh, it. It I is used to love it. horrible. I'd rather look at com- Comic Sans all day. Than brush yeah. script. Brush I script. think I like brush script because I, I went through this phase as a kid where I thought I wanted to be a calligrapher. So I, my parents bought me all the pins and all that, and I'm learning wow. all the strokes and everything. Uh, and my well, I'm, my I'm penmanship today is horrible. So you know. <laughs> you 
I'm going to bring us out this this rabbit hole and and ask you the Pull question, out. Frederick. You've heard, you've heard our um, our picks from Adobe. I'm, you'd love to hear which one stood out for you personally. So the ones that you guys mentioned, absolutely, especially the the Boca Bokeh, Boca whatever in in Lightroom. Okay. But the the one okay. that surprised me the most was in Premiere. And I don't know if this was a beta or if this is a feature that's shipping now, but it was the basically adding generative fill to objects on a premiere timeline. And I think what they demonstrated, and I'll put a link to this in the show notes, they demonstrated just on stage, they had a video of a guy walking with a, a, a suit jacket on and a button down shirt with no tie. They did a quick sloppy selection around the tie area here and just wrote tie in the contextual menu bar and it put a tie on him and then he pressed play and the tie was perfect and tracked with him. <laughs> so now the character, and it was, yeah. it was indistinguishable from, you know, from what I could see, it looked like you would never know that that tie wasn't there to begin with. The possibility in color have changes. the technology to do that. Yeah, the yeah. technology to do that coupled with the processing powers that we now have to do it live on stage. That's just crazy. That's bonkers. Uh, yeah, that's, where that's bonkers. Yeah. And he's probably on a laptop too. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. That that kind of stuff really excites me. The possibilities of that, the generative stuff, and you know, just AI. I think in general, for a lot of reasons, is I mean, a lot of people. It's scary, but I think it is. It's uh, well, what did Alan Greenspan used to say back in the day? I'm cautiously optimistic about the future of AI, right? I think there's going to be some scary stuff because we got scary people on the planet, but tools like this, this, this really get me excited about what, what can be done, what I can do. And more importantly, what, you know, people that have vision and talent can do. So I can't, I can't wait to see what comes out. The, the, uh, and some of the premier pro stuff, you know, for people in our space, creating content like this, you know, working on video, you know, some of the AI stuff now to that we've used in the kind of audio podcasting world to remove filler words, uh, to find the ums and the as and remove filler words, um, yeah. and to edit to edit on the, the the text timeline rather than in on the audio timeline. Now they're doing that live in video, you know, and it's working live demos on stage where they remove the filler words and the time timeline's already edited on on the video. It's Quite spectacular yeah, to see how, that's, how simple you know that's what, happening. That is, that's not new, though. Uh, kudos to Adobe for putting that in there. I think they launched that feature at NAB. Uh, but what was it? One of the tools I have is called Descript. I know you guys both know about that. Mm -hmm. So Descript, Descript built their whole business on that and like switching the metaphor to edit the text like a Google Doc and have the changes ripple out to the timeline. But they took it one step further. And I'm sure, you know, of course, Premiere is going to do this too, I'm sure. But they took it to the level of now you can also do what they call overdub and create a clone of your voice. Your voice back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With the premise being, uh, or the, the, the tool, the purpose of the tool being if you misspeak. So you do this piece and you say Apple instead of Microsoft 13 times in there, you could do a global search and replace replace all occurrences of this word with that word and have it insert your voice into the timeline. It'll generate it and make sure that the inflection is correct with the words around it and seamlessly blend it in together with ambient, all those things it can just do while you're just typing. Of course, it's not going to generate video, so you'd have to have B-roll on top of that, but damn, right? <laughs> it's not going to generate video. It may very well generate video. Right. No, yes. absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's another. Did you did you hear the other sound bite? It, it struck me um, during the the keynote um, uh, when Shantanu came on stage and he said that with Firefly alone, the community had created three billion images already on Firefly. Oh my god! And that's nuts. No, I didn't hear that part. Wow. But here's the here's the interesting part. A month ago, one month ago, they'd only generated two million. Two, yeah, two. Sorry, two billion. Okay, thank so you. Two months. <laughs> two, sorry, two months ago, they generated two billion, and in a month, it's at three billion images on Firefly. Just yeah, a lot of content yeah. getting created. They were all, yeah, they were and all it's training the AI too. 
Well, yeah. Well, what else is there? You know. Um, yeah, and all this, all this activity is training the AI. And my, you know, if you zoom out, we're all, you know, of of a certain age, a respectable age. If you zoom out oh, of the mean. timeline, yeah, I was trying not to. Say that. But you zoom out from the timeline, and you look at what sh- from the time that you first heard of AI in any kind of like serious context to now has literally for me has been what a year maybe a year right since yeah. since your since your chat gpt moment where you're like okay wait a minute <laughs> you know and you start having that dialogue with chat gpt from that moment to now for me it's been about a year maybe 18 months right so Blink zoom out. out zoom out to let's be aggressive 3 years 3 years from now which is going to go like a blink Processor speeds. I don't even know if Moore's law still applies with M, M level processors, but processor speeds, the, the AIs are getting smarter and smarter. We're on the precipice of generative AI images almost being indistinguishable from real images or human generated images in a lot of ways. That's today in you know October of yeah. 23. What happens in October of 27? What's the world going to look like in this career and field can of we photography? Detect it? Yeah. Are well, we Adobe had their Adobe Adobe one of my things that I wanted to throw in here real quick is Adobe announced this was actually a couple of months ago they announced this when they brought it up again at Max, but their content authenticity, I think that's what they called it, authenticity initiative. Um Credentials where, something. Or other. Yeah, Credentials where basically, you, yeah, you'll be able to tell, CR. and I'll link to it, but you'll be able to tell what's what, right? And if this was created voluntary. by AI. A, it's voluntary. B, you know, it's a big world, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, and who's to yeah. say that this this little $250 billion American company is going to dictate what everybody else does, right? And how are you going to get them to the buy trust. into it? And if you buy into it, it's almost like you're like, okay, I use the Lance Armstrong doping thing a lot yeah, as an example. If you're in a race with Lance, Lance Armstrong and he's doping, you know, either you're going to dope or you're not going to be in the race, period. Or you're going to be okay with being last or whatever because all the other guys are doping. Same with this AI stuff, right? Are you going to, if no one else is, is abiding by the rules, but you are, does that put you at a disadvantage? Or does, it, or, and, or does the moral high ground trump, <laughs> you know, being, you know, using all the tools? So these are, these are the questions that need to answer. Like DNG. You guys remember DNG, right? Adobe pushed the, the DNG format. It's still yeah, out it there. It's a big user of DNG. Yeah. Yeah. But they wanted to be a global kind of standard initiative. I was at Adobe when this, when DNG was being pushed and uh, it never panned out for a variety of reasons, mainly because I think a lot of the camera manufacturers didn't want to be beheld into Adobe. They wanted to innovate on their own raw formats, et cetera. We're, you know, are we going to see that again? It's a world. Yeah. Full of hum- the problem with the world is it's full of humans. That's, you know, that's the downside, but maybe AI will solve that too. Yeah. No. Do you think absolutely. they're ever going to solve them? Do you think they're ever going to have like an ironclad solution for de- detecting AI though? Because I don't think that's going to happen. I don't no. think you're ever going to be able to. And it, you know that old saying. It was Mark Twain, right? The uh, a lie travels around the world before the truth gets out of bed and puts its boots on or whatever. And look right. at what happens, especially with the war right now and you know Gaza with Israel and mm-hmm. stuff and people sharing things that aren't even real stuff that's from video games you know thank you unreal engine right yeah, yeah. and um before you know it people are outraged and you know that could cause a war or an expansion to a war or change policy and there's just no way to detect it yeah well and there's, and there's there so many will be you know um alistair i know you you have a hard stop you have a, something else to jump into do you want to throw okay. your you're okay? Because I was going to let you do your pick for of the little, week and then... For a little bit. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll wrap up now. Uh, but we should definitely continue this. Sharky, I want to I want to continue this, uh, just the whole, like, the Unreal Engine conversation. We didn't talk about AI as it applies to audio. I was, I've been playing with 11 labs over mm. the past week, and oh my God, right? I mean, they introduced this dubbing feature. And uh, if, folks, if you haven't heard of 11 labs, I'll link to it, but just 11 labs, you know, the word 11 labs, no spaces, dot IO is the URL. Go play with that and prepare to have your mind blown. But they, rev- they released this feature, and I know Adobe has it as well. I think it's in Premiere or at 
release in beta or in the Skunk Works where it will dub for you, right? Or it will overdub a video. So I wanted to test it. In fact, I was looking for a video on this, this part that I need to put on my car and I was looking for instructions on how to do it. Couldn't find any instructions except one video that was in Chinese. And I had just heard about this feature. So I'm like, all you do is give it the URL. So you give it the, the YouTube URL and say go. And it, you know, what I was thinking was it was gonna overdub and just put some generic robotic you know, English on top of the, the Chinese and then kind of lower the Chinese and bring up the, what this damn thing did <laughs> was, it took that video, this was a short clip, it took that video and it found the subject, the guy that was talking and there was a bunch of people around him talking and asking questions and all that and there was a narrator in the scene, I believe. It took all three, generated separate voices for each of them, placed them in the video at the appropriate times, added the ambient or left the ambient in somehow so there was the noise and clanking and all that over the the actual audio and then it had all the other people in the background making comments and they were also they were making comments in Chinese and now they're making comments you know behind the scenes in English. It was brilliant. It was like I was blown away by what's possible from that. And the thing that came out, one of the, the, the light bulb moments that I had was Holy crap, this means that markets kind of open up for people. Because now you can work and deliver products in other languages. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily English that you deliver. Say a course, say you're doing a training course on how to use Capture One or whatever. Now you can do that training course in English and then dub it out to whatever you want. You know, wherever your target market is, you can dub it into their language and be yeah, done but, with it. But I so. think the, mar yeah, the marketing team here, you know, at, at, at our brands, the... Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of work goes into translating emails and translating any type of content we did, and they've they showcased it at Adobe Max uh, and, and text uh, within Adobe Express, where they created mm -hmm. uh, some flyers and um, some various things that, um, for for their marketing team, uh, all in English, and then just had it generated in nine different languages, whatever languages mm -hmm. they chose. So that was, and that was on text. So yeah, the, the obvious next space to do that is on our video content, have create one piece of video content and then generate it into uh, various different languages for different markets. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a direction of travel. And is it, yeah. is it changing their lips in, in the video? So no, it looks like no. they're actually it's speaking dubbed. it. That's next. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I think, I think there's a lot that's coming. I think one of the, one of the things that's coming is uh, as processor speeds increase, hopefully, you know, over time, I'd love to see that real time. Can you imagine being in a Zoom meeting where there's it's an international call, but you only hear English like the United Nations, right? So you only hear your language. And when you speak, it comes out in whatever other language. I think that's that's the holy grail. So it has Amazing. to be fast. Yeah. People fish that's, moment, right? Oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah, the universal translator from Star Trek. That's what that is. So, yeah, I want to see that. Um, so enough of that. Let's let's do let's let's continue this uh, in another show. But clearly, there's a lot to talk about. And clearly, the stuff is not dying down. So, you know, I'm sure the topic will be back like Arnold. Um, let's uh, let's transition to our picks of the week. And I'm going to say this just for Sharky James, because I know he loves this. The pick of the week is the segment on our you show love it where, where we allow the guests to pick any topic as long as it is related even tangentially to photography. Yeah. Sharky James, what is your pick of the week? <laughs> There's a tangentially with the Delta and then you take the lens cap off. I don't know. All, I know all the old twip. Hey, everything old is new again. That's my story. <laughs> My pick of the week, because it's so darn awesome, and uh, Frederick was a little uh, dubious about it at first, but when he got yeah. himself one, the newest one, which I don't know if it's still on Kickstarter. Is it still on Kickstarter, Frederick? It's still on, it's still on Kickstarter, one? but it's like overfunded now, so they were looking for like, what, 10 grand, and they got like, I don't know, more than that, let's say. <laughs> Always ask for a low amount, because it'll be impressive. But uh, yeah. so my pick, I've got the original Smoke Genie. So this is going to be great for you that are just listening to the podcast. But those, that's, <laughs> hey, the, the view count's going to go way up on the video on YouTube. But behind me, I've got the original Smoke Genie. And you can see it is going crazy back Fire. there. So 
It's a very Fire. glorified Fire. Fire. Turn around, Mike. Very Turn around. Glorified. Yeah. Very, <laughs> what's going on back there? It's a very gl- glorified uh, vape device, but so much more. And there's uh, you get these other. Uh, <laughs> thanks for zooming in there. I'll, I'll make <laughs> unnecessary now. zoom. <laughs> unnecessary zoom. But um, it's a. Let me grab it. If you can see it through the smoke. So it is this this is the original Smoke Genie that was on Kickstarter, I don't know, a year plus or so ago. And uh and you can make smoke come out the top of it. And it's supposedly safe. I don't know. I didn't do any labs on it, but they say it's safe. I it's uh based out of Hong Kong. There's a team over there, Mickey and the other guys. It, it's uh PMI, PMI gear.com. And uh they do a lot of commercials and magic the, the M in PMI is magic, right? And so they do a lot of uh, commercials, TV things, uh, work on feature films. Look, I'm covered in smoke here. This is it's Idaho, good. so it's not the it's other ambient. Stuff. It's good. It's yeah. your it's your portrait. <laughs> really, atmosphere. <laughs> Got some atmosphere going here. But uh, yeah. here you can. I see didn't know that was stuff. legal. I didn't know that was legal in uh, in that state yet, Sharky. That's amazing. <laughs> not legal in Idaho and <laughs> probably flavor for a long time. What flavor is it? <laughs> let's see. Let's strawberry. Let's try. Yeah, I'm not That's doing the first that. First time I've tried that, I probably just shortened my life by about, about exactly. three and a half weeks. Whatever right happened there. to Sharky? <laughs> <I'm not laughs> but uh, it's uh, this particular one. You can control the uh, the amount of uh, how much it blows out, uh, how much actual smoke, how fast it blows out. There's a whole bunch of other features, and the the Pro Kit I think comes with a bunch of different tubes and stuff. You have you can't turn it upside down because it won't physically work. You know physics and all. So It'll send it down this uh, like medical grade rubber tube down to this uh, mesh kind of thing, and you can put it in like a shot glass or a champagne glass, and do you can just do really cool effects. Talk about it, Frederick. Talk about what your impression was first, and then when you actually you got the newest one, so it's like uh, it's kind of like a mini version. Yeah, the, yeah, the one I got, and I'll you know. Of course, you guys aren't seeing this, but there will be beautiful B-roll shots of this product as, as we speak about it. Uh, but the one I got feels like it's not as robust as the one you got. Like, I don't have all the LCDs and levels and all that stuff on it, but it works brilliantly. When I first saw that thing, Sharky came to one of our This Week in Photo member mixers, which we do every Friday for community members. And he showed that thing, and he started talking about it and, you know, what he could do. And I was like, yeah, you just go get a smoke machine, all the Amazon, get the juice and press the button, plug it in and go. This thing, of course, throw, goes in your camera bag. It takes no space. USB chargeable, lasts all day. You get the reservoir, you fill it. It's kind of like a, it's like one of those, you know, if if you or someone you know is a professional vapor, and you know, with the big giant vape machines and all that, and the giant reservoir, and they make the clouds. It's like that, but with a different a different, uh, a larger form factor, I think, and a different solution that goes in it. So when I first saw it, I was thinking, okay, that's okay. These guys just basically put a vape together and made some different juice and increased the, the wattage going through the coil and, you know, now they're making money. Uh, no, it's, it's much, it's much more involved than that. Uh, and after playing with it, like Sharky was saying, it comes with these attachments that let you it, uh, create kind of a low-lying, almost dry ice look. In fact, it has three modes. Mine has three modes on it. It's got dry ice, mist, and fog. And the dry ice one requires an attachment. So you could take like a glass of wine, for example, or whatever, put the attachment on there, press the button, and it will fill up the glass from the bottom up with this thick kind of smoke that you can even just pour out of it. Just it's yeah, it's kind of amazing, especially I think for people that do product photography or food photography, seems like it'd just be a no-brainer to keep this in your bag all the time. So, yeah, I'm a fan. I was dubious at the beginning, but you know, after learning more and playing with it, no longer dubious. Well, so, no, good no, I'm playing with it right now. I have one. <laughs> Yeah, we got to get you one. We got Hey, Mickey, if you're watching one, just, this, just to play with Alistair. <laughs> yeah, Alistair needs one. Alistair needs one. Yeah, we'll, you got to we'll watch the video. I'm screwing around like crazy over here. Yeah, if you're not watching this video, you need to watch the video because Sharky is uh, he's doing stuff. Unfortunate. I'm testing the <laughs> autofocus of my Fuji XT4 right now, and it's doing All right. a great job. 
So smokegeniepmigear.com is Sharky James' pick of the week. Alistair Jolly, what is your pick of the week? Well, this weekend, North America went a little bit photo crazy because you all had uh, an eclipse this weekend, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually had to Google to see when the next one we're going to get here in the UK. I'm not sure when it is, but... You all have another one next April. Total, total eclipse next April 8th in oh, North America. Nice. Um, and my go-to, whenever I'm thinking star trails, whenever I'm thinking sun positions, whenever I'm thinking moon strike, all those things, whenever I need to work out where it's going to be, when it's going to be, and you know where I need to be to line up my shot, my go-to app is always Photo Pills. And if you haven't yes. checked out Photo Pills, uh, please go check out photo pills and you will be amazed at the ability um, to look into the future with photo pills and know exactly where all those uh, sunsets, sunrises, moon shots, lunar eclipses, where they're all going to be in the future and you can line up your shot if you want the the sunset or the sunrise to be directly behind the Eiffel Tower, then you can work all that out with photo pills. Yeah, it's a great app uh, and a phenomenal team behind it. A great, great yeah. team behind that app with uh, a, a wonderful community as well. So go check out photo pills. Yeah, it is. And we've had them on the show before. And the context of that show was around planning and the importance of planning mm -hmm. and you know how, how do those photographers get those shots how do they manage to get those amazing shots all the time well because they don't half-ass it and they think about what they're going to do before they actually go out there because i think a lot of photographers especially i think newer photographers will think hey i'm a I'm a, I'm a superhero i'm going to load myself down with all the best gear and everything i need to capture any given situation and i'm going to drop myself behind enemy lines at some picturesque location and pop out with great photos and only part of that is right, right? All the gear stuff, great, you can have all that, but the planning piece, especially with a tool like photo pills, if you say, oh, I, like you said, Alistair, I wanna get a shot with the moon sitting just above the tip of the, the Eiffel Tower, and you know it's gotta be at night, and yada, 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 all these things, if you wanna do it, in camera versus using technology, you know, the the AI and Photoshop and all that. If you want to do it and get it right on the sensor, then photo pills comes in and you say, okay, when is the moon going to be right here? And where do I, if I'm going to be standing here, what's my field of view and all this stuff. So you can basically, I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alistair, like you could you could create it like a dossier of what the shot is going to be on paper, like where you need to stand, what focal length you're going to use, what kind of exposure you're going to use, all that stuff, and have it done before you yeah. even leave the damn house. And then you go over there, yeah. and now you're just executing, right? Yeah, and it'll take into account the height of the, the mountain, the height of the Eiffel Tower, and where you are and tell you like how far you have to be away from it so that the moon or the sun or whatever is just above it. Um, it's yeah. it's an incredibly deep app, but also yeah. a very simple fun app as well. So you know, if you just want to know what time sunset, sunrise, it will do that. But yeah, it's it's a must have tool if you're serious about, you know, star trails, Milky Way shots, you know, lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, all that stuff. It's a phenomenal app from a phenomenal Absolutely. team. It's it's easier than the photographer's ephemeris if you've used that before, but definitely mm -hmm. hit YouTube University, watch some videos. You can screw it up and you can be in the wrong place and miss the shot. So check your math and make sure you get it right. Because I've heard from people yeah. before, they're like, I got photo pills and I, I screwed it up, but it was totally their fault. Right, right. Not photo well, pills, photo there's pills. like a ton, and they're and they're putting them out all the time, right? There's like a ton of training tutorials and how tos and all that. So yeah, it's it's worth the investment of time to understand the app and how it thinks and the power of it uh, before just like okay, I'm gonna learn this on the plane on my way over to this place yeah. that I'll never be at again in my life, right? <laughs> yeah, gotta, and if you're you super serious about it, in it, yeah, if you're super serious about it, they also do photo pills camp where you can go. They do a week long camp where you can go to head over to Spain and, and I think it's Menorca and uh, spend some time with the team and their ambassadors and stuff and really learn it hands on uh, from the masters of that craft, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I want to do that for sure. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Alistair. That's an excellent pick. 
Uh, and I, they're coming to the desktop as well, if they're not already on the desktop. I mean, when I spoke with them, they were about to release a desktop version. Um, I don't know if it's out yet, but yeah, it's worth a check if you're if you guys are interested in photo pills. Um, the uh, last thing, or at least my pick of the week, is something I was experimenting with yesterday. So if you remember at the Apple, one of the previous Apple announcements, they announced that FaceTime was coming to the Apple TV, meaning you'd be able to do FaceTime calls from your living room or bed, wherever, right? Which makes a lot of sense. And as Alistair was saying before we started recording, yeah, it made even more sense during the pandemic when everyone was on lockdown, you couldn't go anywhere. It wouldn't have been great to just gather around in the living room and you know, use share play and watch a movie with your loved ones since you couldn't be in close proximity to them. Uh, well, now it's here. They The feature was released and it is on Apple TV. You'll be able to tell if you have it on, if your Apple TV is recent enough to run it by the FaceTime icon showing up in that top row of frequently used apps that you have on your Apple TV. You'll now have a FaceTime icon in there that you can click and it'll basically run FaceTime. It will then look for your for a camera or your continuity camera, which is an iPhone that is running the a recent version of the OS and it'll connect to it wirelessly and use its cameras like these uh, these back cameras on there, the high quality cameras. So it'll use those cameras and do the whole, uh, what do you call it, center stage feature. So if it's just you, it'll zoom in on you. And if another person joins you, it'll zoom out a little bit, you know, kind of what you'd expect it to do. My living room, my television is uh, about, I want to say maybe seven ish feet away from the couch. And that's where I was testing at sitting on the couch, doing a FaceTime call in front, uh, in front of the big screen TV, using the microphone from the, from the phone and the camera on the phone, audio coming through my sound system, video coming through the big screen TV. After about three minutes of conversation, I forgot that I was using the technology. It was just a conversation at that point. They said they could hear me great. I could hear them fine. The thing is tracking me around. It felt, it felt like you know, the only friction was mounting the phone on top of the, of the television. So how do yeah. you do that? So that's my pick of the week. That's this guy. Let me put myself on screen here. So that's this guy right here. It's a little device from Belkin, and it's this is surprisingly robust. It's metal. It's a heavier metal, so it's weighted. In here is a MagSafe magnetic ring for your MagSafe-compatible iPhone, right? And it's got a little lip on the back here to clamp on the back of your television. So the way it goes is, so if, say this is your television. This is the screen here, right? You'd unfold this thing and hang it on your TV, kind of like that, right? And then your phone would go on this side. Whoop, make sure I got it right, yeah. So your phone would clamp on there, you know, either this way or this way. There you go, so now your phone's on there, facing the living room, your camera's facing the living room, and boom, that's it. No wires, no muss, no fuss. I bought two of these things, one to kind of float around and maybe live next to the television in the living room, and one that's gonna go on my camera bag so that I can use it on my MacBook Pro or in the office here if I need to use it. Cool thing about this thing is not only does it feel like it's gonna last forever, probably outlast the phone for sure, but it's got a, a quarter 20 socket on the bottom so you can mount this thing on a tripod or anything that can take that which is great for just general purpose keeping your camera bag so now you can mount your phone on a tripod wherever you happen to be to do videos long exposures you know the streaming content etc so it's not cheap though that was the thing about it they make some cheaper ones um the like there's a little plastic one that's out that i also have in my camera bag that this replaces i think it's like I don't know, 15 bucks or something. And it's just a mag, you know, a magnetic ring with a lip on it that you just drop on the top of your display. It only work on, that one will only work on thin displays. I think it was designed for like a MacBook Pro or something. This one is designed to work on thicker televisions, like anything that's up to this, oops, sorry, I got it on the wrong one. So anything that is up to this thickness right there, it will, you know, if you have a TV that's that thick, you know, then, then yeah. you're, uh, you know, you need to upgrade your TV. <laughs> but, are there rubber but pads? It, well, well, are there <laughs> rubber pads on it? Yeah, yeah. Are there yeah, rubber it's, pads? There, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of this is like this 
you know, almost like a like a neoprene kind of soft, almost like a like a like this. It feels like it's made out of the same stuff that the iPhone mm. silicon case is made out of on the back here. So it's not going to scratch anything. You can't go wrong with Belkin. Belkin's awesome. They've been around forever yeah, and they make great products. Solid. Yeah. So yeah. Now your case, you have to. I know this. You know this from messing around. If you have a case that doesn't have that extra ring on it to add, you know, more magnetism to it, you're gonna might. Your phone might don't do drop. it probably not don't on your it. tv but if you're bouncing around in your car yeah but get yeah a, get a proper case or do it directly to your phone absolutely yeah that's a that's a big tip yeah right? because you can you can go buy any cheap old iphone case from the mall kiosk or from wherever and it, if it doesn't have a ring on it like here's here's a let me just show you guys so like if you can see this i don't know if you can see it yep. well uh, yeah you can see it see that ring right there that's a that's a metal ring. I think that's metal. I don't think it's magnetic, but it's a metal ring that allows the the device to connect through MagSafe to MagSafe compatible devices. Not all cases have that ring on them, though. So what you may get a case that looks identical to this, even from Apple, but with no ring in there. It's not MagSafe compatible. That means things like that Belkin device or your car mount or wherever aren't going to work. Yeah, you know, they may stick, but it's not going to get juice, you know, all the things. So, yeah, just spend the extra 10 bucks. I mean, it's probably a, it's probably OK on your TV, but bouncing around in your car, your phone's right. Gonna, you know, it's going to end yeah, up. I would just McDonald's spend the extra 10 bucks from seven years ago. Get the right case or yeah. take the case off and stick it up there. All right, guys, we're at the end of the show. <laughs> what, was it? what was that? <laughs> stick it up where? Stick it up there. Yeah. Get the right case and stick it up there. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> There's a show title. Yeah, I know. That's it right there. All right. Let's, I, I let's wrap it. The, the extra tip or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I ended it just in time. See, Sharky has a shelf yeah. life before he slides into that. In there. <laughs> let's, uh, yeah, let's, 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 let's 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 for more blue work. That's right. If you want to hear Sharky really go off the rails, come to a Twit Mixer. Sharky uh, uncha Unchained. Oh, my God. On a Friday night. Yeah, it's insane. Um Sharky, let me give you the, the first last word, you know, as we wrap this up. Give me your final thoughts on, you know, the, the Max stuff, your sage, your sage opinion about the future of stuff with Max uh, or anything else that you have to announce or promote or anything. Let us know. My opinion. Oh, you know, I'm going to promote. I know. That's why <laughs> I said opinion. that. I, I gave you permission. <laughs> you, you know me. You know me. Help a brother out, right? Uh -huh. No, uh, my opinion is that uh, Lightroom with this latest update with lens blur became more compelling. And I can't wait to see what we're going to have in the next few years. And I, like I said, I'm worried about how, you know, Capture One and these other programs out there are going to be able to compete because they've got a lot of money to throw at it. Maybe these other, you know, people don't. So we'll see. But all right, here's the promo part. You want to save 20% on a whole lot of actually good. <laughs> Did I do it like really? That's really sales people. Like this Saturday, Saturday, Saturday only. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, people listen to my show know that Fujifilm has sponsored my show for over four years. I don't have any codes for you there yet. But if you go on over to lenssharkcom slash deals or just go lenshark.com and click the deals link up there. Uh, there's I have a code Sharky 20 S H A R K Y. There's no E in there. 20 Sharky 20. You get 20% off uh, the U.S. sites for Benro. So, you know, Benro makes a lot of tripods. They're one of my sponsors. So BenroUSA.com, ShimodaDesigns.com. They're, you know, they make great outdoor bags. Kupo Grip, K-U-P-O Grip.com. A lot of grip gear, um, C-stands and such. PhotixUS.com, Tenba. Tenba makes great bags. Tenba.com, mm -hmm. CeramonicUSA.com for audio gear, and uh, JupioUS.com for batteries. That's what, like, the one area in photography where you could actually save some money is by getting third-party batteries from a trusted company, and Jupio is one of those. So, Sharky20.com. I don't get anything. The sponsors are happy, though. And you can find me on the socials at Lens Shark everywhere. Not Len Shark. I'm not responsible for what that guy says. Don't forget the two S's in the middle there. There Love you go. It. Boom. Very done. Good. Sharky, thank you. All right. <laughs> Alistair Jolly, what do you think? Final words? Final words. Uh, it's been a great week for photography. You know, it's been a busy week, uh, you know, with Adobe creating all that 
cool opportunities for us to talk about and experiment with and then leading into you know a fun weekend with the the eclipse and just seeing so many photograph photos on my feed and seeing people out there you know trying out new techniques and stuff to capture the eclipse so it was a fun week in photography um i would of course encourage everybody here to go check out the this week in photo Flickr group and get involved there and and take that group from strength to strength and be amongst like-minded people who love to share the photography talk about photography and just being a really cool community so go check out Flickr for that uh, and yeah of course you'll find me pretty much everywhere at alistair jolly Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you both for coming on. I appreciate you. This is this is one of those conversations that could have easily gone on for, you know, another hour plus or so. There's so much to talk about. And, you know, I, I tend to be long winded. So thank you. Thank you yeah, both for keeping enough. me grounded. <laughs> That's a, Alistair, you are my ballast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have a podcaster on, you're going to double the time. I know, I know, yeah. And plus, this stuff is just so exciting. So my last, my last words before we wrap this are that this is, don't be afraid, right? This is an exciting time for photographers. Sure, there are lots of change, and with change comes uncertainty, right? And granted, in a lot of areas, a lot of industries are going to be impacted by the coming changes. New industries are going to be created. Uh, Sand Hill Road here in Silicon Valley is notorious for having a large concentration of venture, venture capitalists over there. And guess where all their money mostly is going right now? What kind of startups? So we know the, the era that's coming. I think you folks that are watching and listening to this have the the one up on everyone else. So consider this, ChatGPT, which we all been talking about forever. We feel like it's old tech now. It's just part of how we do stuff. We are part eight of months. only, a, yeah, eight months. And <laughs> we are part of only what, like 10 to 15% of the population on the planet that even know what chat GPT is. So right now you're operating with superpowers. So, and the gift of knowledge, right? Or the curse of knowledge, meaning you know something and you assume everyone else knows it, they don't. So now you have this window of time where you can do stuff and prepare for the future like never before, I think, whether it's a startup, startup or you know, redefining or enhancing the way that you create art or the way you write or the way you do audio, now is your chance, right, over the next couple of months as this stuff starts evolving, because it's not going away. It's not like, you know, people think, oh, yeah, it's just like that NFT crap that came and went and no one believed it. And then, you know, all this stuff went down. This is a technology, as you can tell by companies like Adobe and Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, etc., investing like literal GDPs of company of countries into this technology in a quarter to make stuff happen, you know, notwithstanding Apple and what's coming with them with their new Vision Pro headset and all that. So it's an exciting time to be a content creator, an artist, a photographer, et cetera. Embrace that. Get in there and play with that stuff. Look at our picks. Go play with that stuff. You don't have to like play with it and say, okay, I got to use this in my life, but just play with it. Play with this stuff and get excited and start understanding the possibilities of what could happen and what might happen so that you understand it better versus being on the sidelines and saying, man, back in 2023, I, w I really wish I had done X, Y, and Z, right? Or I, in, in 1984, I really wish I had invested in Apple, right? We're there right now. So no excuses in like 2034. So dive in, play with this stuff, get excited, make cool crap, share it with everybody, teach other people how to use it, rinse and repeat, you know? So that's that's my that's my soapbox. So we'll leave it right there. Sharky James, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you. Hopefully you'll Always. show up Friday night at our next thing. We'll see you over there. I think so. I'll probably be shooting a game again. You can watch my phone tumble to the ground. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> o only I shoot football games. And people are looking at my screen. They're like, who are all those old guys? What are you doing? <laughs> You watching what those, something while you're shooting? With those strange boxes with the, the the white tube sticking out of them, I have no idea. What those are. Yeah. No, so will you, and uh, Alistair, thank you for for your patience today. We started late, and it's Alistair's in Scotland, so it is late, late there. I'm in California. It's only lunchtime here. Yeah, it's not that late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thank you, regardless, for your patience as we got this thing started. See you next week.
and we will see you next week. And uh, yeah, keep an eye out to the, on the TWIP list for a notification on who's coming on and the time of the show and if we're going to be streaming or recording, all that stuff. Just stay subscribed to the TWIP email list. And with that, folks, it is time to take that lens cap off. This is TWIP.